Good morning, church. I hope you're doing well today. Uh, if you don't know me, my name's Billy. I get the privilege to be one of the pastors here, and that's a huge honor for me. Uh, if this is your first time, uh, we want you to know that everything we do here is about connecting people uh, to a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And uh, we say that a lot, but we really mean it. Uh, we want you to have a relationship with Jesus, and we want you to grow in that relationship uh, with Christ. And so everything from the music to the, to the sermon, uh, to uh, our small groups that meet during the week, to our kids' ministry, student ministry, everything we do as a church uh, is motivated by that one statement. And so uh, we're glad you're here today. We say a special welcome to you. You come on a good Sunday. Uh, we're starting the book of 1 Corinthians uh, so if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Uh, while you do that, uh, I do want to celebrate one thing. So today is the one-year anniversary of Connection Church Athens, uh, which is the church because of your generosity uh, that we were able to plant a year ago. And uh, so that's something to celebrate. God's done some incredible things there. <clears throat> And so God is saving people, and he is uh, discipling people and, and doing all kinds of things up in Athens because of that. And so uh, we're super excited about that and pray that God would help us uh, plant more and more churches uh, to reach more and more people. So if you have your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 is where we're going to be. I want to kind of set the background. If you weren't here last week, I really talked a lot about Acts chapter 18. Uh, Acts 18 is actually where the Apostle Paul planted the church of Corinth, and so the Bible gives us the kind of the start of uh, this Corinthian church. And we saw uh, Paul kind of come in, and he hooked up with a couple named Aquila and Priscilla, and helped make some tents there. Uh, the Jews didn't really receive him very well, uh, but he moved away from the temple over to uh, Justice's house and began to preach the gospel. And God began to save some people. And really, we see the birth of this church in Corinth. And so you need to know a little bit about the city. Of Corinth, it is a big city. Uh, it is in what we know now as Greece, uh, and so during that time period, it was a huge trade city. There was a lot going on. Uh, it was a city that was full of of trade and traffic and all kinds of stuff going on there. Uh, but it was also a very uh, sinful city. It was a very dark place. There was a lot going on. A lot of commentators compare it to like Las Vegas, where there's just if you want trouble, uh, there, there's a lot of trouble to get in there. Um, you know, they, they talk about how the city was mainly characterized by sexual sin, very promiscuous and a lot of stuff going on. Uh, it was also characterized by idolatry. There were, if you would have walked into Corinth during this time period, there would have been temples everywhere to different kinds of gods. You would have seen uh, one to the, goddess, uh, to the god Apollos, who was a very uh, athletic Olympian. And so that was one god you would have seen. And then up on a mountain, you would have seen... Uh, a temple to the goddess of Aphrodite, which is the goddess of sexual love. And so out of that, there was a lot of prostitution and a lot of stuff going on uh, from there. But then also the city was characterized by uh, a pride and arrogance. So not only were they living in sin, but they were very proud of this lifestyle. And it was uh, uh, would have been a very, very difficult place to plant a church. And so, of course, the Apostle Paul is up to challenges. And so he goes into... Uh, Corinth and begins to plant this church. And so now we get to read uh, one of his first letters uh, back to the church of Corinth. After he planted, he moved on to Ephesus. And then a little while after that, he wrote back this letter to help uh, correct some of the things that were going on there and also just check in on the church in Corinth. And so that's where we pick up today. First Corinthians chapter one, verse one. Uh, you can read with me if you have your Bible. If not, it'll be on the screen uh, right behind you. So uh, Paul, called to be an apostle, this is verse 1, of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes. All right, so Sosthenes is a really cool story. It doesn't have anything to do with the sermon, but I'll tell you about him. Uh, Sosthenes, if you read the book, chapter 18 in the book of Acts, Sosthenes is actually uh, a person that was uh, opposing Paul, right? He was a Jewish man. Uh, he really wanted to get Paul kicked out of the city of Corinth. Uh, so he brings him before the governor or the judge, so to speak, at that time and uh, tries to make an argument against Paul to get him kicked out of the city. Uh, basically, the judge is like, I'm not getting in your religious drama. You guys go away. Well, then the crowd turned on Sosthenes and started beating him up and really uh, beat him up. And the next time he shows up in the Bible, now he's become a Christian. So uh, I don't know if he got the Christianity beat into him 
or if he just became converted to Christ uh, because of uh, who Christ is. No, we know he probably saw Christ for who he was. God saved him, and now he's a part, obviously, of the church in Corinth. And that's why Paul would say to the Corinthians, not only is he apostle, an apostle approved by God, which is huge, but also this uh, Jewish leader, Sosthenes, also recognized him now as an apostle sent from God with the authority of God with him. Verse two, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people. I want you to underline sanctified. I want you to underline called to be his holy people. And together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. I want you to underline together. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. So think about when Paul thinks about the church in Corinth, he thinks about the grace of God because it's only the grace of God that can work in the heart of a dark, sinful person like you and I and the people of Corinth. And so he's very much crediting the grace of God for the work that he's seen in Corinth. Verse five, for in him you have been enriched in every way. I want you to underline enriched. With all kinds of speech and with all knowledge, God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Verse seven, therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift. I want you to underline spiritual gift. As you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. Verse eight, he will also keep you firm to the end. I want you to underline keep you. So that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful who called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 10, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another and in what you say, and that there may be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. Verse 11, my brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. Stop for a minute. Um, you're telling me there's fighting within the church in the Bible? Like, what? Is that crazy to you guys or not? I mean, it's, it's crazy to think that people were fighting in the church then and people now fight in the church today. Is that, that may just be a pastor joke there, but um, I think that's kind of funny. And he says, what I mean, and, and then I also think it's funny that he says somebody from Chloe's household. Can you imagine uh, the people in Corinth opening this letter and saying, hey, somebody from Chloe's household, Chloe's like, whoa, hold on now, like, what, what did I, yeah. and so of course, I don't know what happened to her after this, we don't ever see her uh, again, but apparently Paul called her out there uh, to, to, to telling on what was going on, which was a good thing, but in her shoes, probably not so good. So uh, Chloe's household informed me that there are quarrels among you, there's fighting in the church, verse 12, what I mean is this, one of you says, I follow Paul, another I follow Apollos, another says, I follow Cephas, and still another says, I follow Christ. And so we see the division in the church is being caused by a preference in who their favorite preacher is, right? So that doesn't sound common today, does it? That, that we want to go to a place where we like the preacher the best. If the preacher sucks, I'll go to the next place. And if he sucks there, I'll go to the next place, right? So we just have this mindset uh, that, that came from Corinth, so to speak. So you have Paul, uh, who obviously planted the church here. Some people liked him. You have Apollos, who was another guy. Uh, the Bible talks about him being a very eloquent speaker. He was very persuasive. Uh, Paul was very uh, smart and a great church planner, but you know the Bible teaches he wasn't that great of a speaker. People kind of, when he came to him in person, they were like, oh, wow, I thought you'd be bigger. Or I thought you'd be better than this. And so Paul had this appearance that didn't seem as powerful as when he was writing letters. And Apollos apparently was the opposite of that. When you saw him, he had this booming voice and just incredible way of, of, of speaking, and he was very educated, and people loved to listen to him. And then others said, I follow Cephas. If you know anything about the Bible, Cephas and Peter are the same person. So these people would have probably said, well, Paul, you weren't, you weren't an original 12 of disciple of Christ, and Apollos, you speak well, but I want to hear Peter because Peter was with Jesus. And I relate to Peter because Peter always was screwing something up. 
And so I like this guy. This is the guy I want. And so you had him. And then on the other hand, you had people that just said, I follow Christ. And that sounds great, but commentators actually say that these were the people that were causing the most issues because they were kind of the the arrogant people that kind of always had an answer for everything, and, and it was always the holy art thou answer, and they wouldn't really deal with the problem that was going on. So Paul goes on to say in verse 13, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius. Uh, verse 15, so no one can say that you were baptized in my name. And yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanas. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. Now is Paul against baptism? No, that's not what he's teaching. He's teaching it doesn't matter who baptizes you, right? The church is about Jesus and Jesus alone. It's not about preachers. It's not about who baptizes you. Even when you're baptized, you're baptized in the name of the what? Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So don't make it about anything other than what God has designed the church to be about, which is Christ. Verse 17, for Christ did not send me, Paul, to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of his power. And so we see Paul is just trying to teach them. It's not about different people. It's not about your favorite preacher. It's not about any of that. The church is about Christ. And the message that we preach is the message of Christ. It doesn't matter who's preaching the message of Christ. It matters that the message of Christ is being preached. And that's what the church is all about. And so in this passage, I'm actually going to preach the rest of chapter one next week. So if you want to come back, that would be great. Uh, this, the, but I want to point out three things to you today that I think will be helpful uh, for each of us. The first is I want you to see Paul's definition of the church. So in this, in his greeting, what we see is when Paul thinks about the church or when God's word teaches us about the church, we can learn God's view of the church. And, 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 and we can align it, hopefully, and, and hold it up against what our view of the church is and learn what God thinks of when he thinks of the church. The second thing is I want to talk to you about the work of grace in our lives. And so Paul goes on to say, and when he's thanking uh, God for the Corinthians, he talks about how the grace of God has transformed their lives. And he gives us some ways that it has transferred his life. And then the third thing is he corrects them. And so I want to talk to you about what it looks like to be corrected by God and why we as the people of God should be open to God's correction because it's through his correction that he aligns us to where he wants us to be. And the fact that if we are beyond God's correction, then we are beyond growth as a Christian. And so correction, I know it seems like a bad thing, but it's actually a really, really good thing that the church needs to be open to, and all of us need to be open to, including myself. So the first thing is the church defined. So in verse two, we see this, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, uh, another word for that would be called to be saints or called saints, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. So we see Paul's definition for the church. Does he define it as a building? And everybody says, no. Does he define it as a service? No, right? He defines it as the people. So when, when Paul thinks of the church, he thinks of it this way, a gathering of people, and he thinks of them both locally and globally. So he sees the church in Corinth as, as, as a church, but he also connects them to the global church, right? He goes on to say to those everywhere who call on the name of the Lord uh, Jesus as, as Savior and Lord, make up the church. And so we have local churches, and then we have the big C global church. And he says this a gathering of people characterized by three things that he points us to. The first is salvation. So he says that these are the people that have been sanctified. He's referring to salvation, what God does uh, to us at salvation. Secondly, holiness. There are people that are characterized by holiness. They live differently. God has set them apart uh, to accomplish his mission in the world. And then lastly, they're characterized by unity, right? They're unified. They're diverse, and they all have different giftings. They all look differently. They all have different jobs. They're very different, 
but they're unified as a family under the gospel for the purpose of God. And it's an incredible picture of what the church is. So let's talk about each of these things. The first is salvation. He says to those sanctified in Christ Jesus. Uh, we usually think of sanctification as a lifelong process of becoming more and more holy or more and more Christ-like. And so if you've been through our heart and soul class, uh, which is going on right now, if you haven't been, you need to go. One of the things that we talk about in there is God's view of salvation and what it means for you to be saved. And, and we talk about this idea of sanctification. God doesn't just save you and get you out of this line going to heaven or in going to hell and getting this line going to heaven, but God's actually doing a supernatural work in you and is going to continue that work of salvation. And this is what we know as sanctification. But here, the word sanctified is used in past tense. And so it's being used for something different. In these verses, uh, something decisive has happened in the past to the church of God, to those sanctified, past tense, that is those who have been, not who are being sanctified in Christ Jesus. So what these verses teach us then is that behind and beneath this lifelong process of growth and sanctification, there is some decisive break. Like there's something that has happened that is a break between the old way of unbelief and sin, the old man and the new man, or a new alignment with a new way of life, of faith and of obedience to God. And this is what happens when we become Christians. Paul's talking about uh, people that have been saved. And he goes on to say it again in 1 Corinthians 6, and it may make a little more sense. Read this with me. Do you not know, this is Paul, that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And then he goes on and he lists an example of the unrighteous people, adulterers, homosexuals, thieves, greedy, drunkards, robbers, etc. And then he goes on to say in verse 11, and such were some of you, right? So the Corinthian church obviously was made up of a lot of those people, adulterers, unrighteous, homosexuals, thieves, greedy, drunkards, all these people. And he says before Christ, that's who you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. And so we see that when God saves a person, in God's eyes, they become a different person. And so in God's eyes, before salvation, we are a sinner, an enemy of God. But the moment we put our faith in Christ and we repent and turn from our sin and turn to God and trust in Christ and his finished work on the cross, in God's eyes, we become different. We become holy. We become blameless. We become sanctified. That's exactly what sanctified means is to be purified, to be consecrated, to, to be made holy, to, to be set apart by God for God. And so I want you to write this down. The prerequisite to being a part of God's church is salvation. So like when the Bible talks to the church or a letter is written to 1 Corinthians, it is written to Christians, right? And so we cannot be a part of God's church if we're not saved, okay? So that's a big deal. So why would we talk about the first week of heart and soul, which is kind of our process to, to help people get involved here, the first thing we talk about is what does it mean to be saved? Because we want people to understand in order to be a part of God's church, you have to have a relationship with God. You have to be surrendered to Christ because that is the prerequisite to being a part of God's church. It's not about Sunday attendance. It's not about church membership rosters. It's not about baptism. It's not about who you were raised by or how you were raised. It's not about how much you know or how much you don't know. The question when it comes to the question of God's church is, are you saved? Like, are you a part of it? Or have you given your life to Christ? Have you stopped living for yourself? And are you living for Jesus under his lordship? So that's the question. Are you a part of God's church? I think that God wants us to ask today. And some of us have never heard this te teaching. And it is a shame that we've never heard this teaching. We have so many people that come through heart and soul and they've never heard this idea of salvation and what it is and what it means and why it's so important when it comes uh, to understanding who we are in Christ. And I'm telling you, if we have the wrong view of salvation, it is detrimental 
to our relationship with God because we will constantly live in this uh, wishy-washy state of not knowing if you're truly saved or not saved. And then if you don't know that, then you're trying to constantly do good things so that God can be happy with you. But when you understand what the Bible teaches about salvation, it frees you up to live in the identity that God has already given you. Like when you're saved, God has already credited your bank account with holiness, righteousness, and blamelessness. So there's nothing you can do to make him change his view of you. And because of that, now as a Christian, we don't live with this yoke on our back trying to be good enough. We live now with a, free, with a freedom to say, God loves me. I'm saved. God has done everything for me that I could never do for myself. And it's important that we understand that. So if we are saved, we need to understand what that means, that we've been justified, sanctified. We're a new creation. We're holy. We're blameless. We're washed. We're clean. And that's not based on anything we've done or based on our performance. It's based on the finished work of Jesus. This is the message of the gospel. This is what it is. And if somebody has told you anything other than that, they have told you wrong, and it's not what the Word of God teaches, and you need to understand God's view of salvation because God's view of salvation is absolutely glorious, and we would, why would we want anything other than his view of salvation? Secondly, holiness. So not only were they a group of people that were characterized uh, by salvation, but they were a group of people characterized by holiness. Holiness. Not only have they been made holy in God's eyes, but verse 2 says, you've been called to be his holy people. That means you've been called to live as saints uh, for, for God. Uh, I love this. We've been called out of sin and called out of the way of the world now to be called for a specific purpose. So when God saves us, he doesn't just call us out of sin. He calls us into purpose, right? So we don't just get saved and say, okay, I don't want to sin anymore. And we live our life in fear that we're going to sin or mess up. No, he calls us out of that sin. And yes, we fight sin, but also he calls us into this purpose. And a part of overcoming sin in our life is having a bigger purpose in life than just living for yourself. And God gives us that when he calls us into, and this is a part of holiness. He's called us out of, uh, out of sin into a specific purpose. And that purpose is to be his people, uh, to be image bearers, uh, to, to reflect him to the world around us. This is why it's so important that we grow in our relationship with God, that we become more and more like Christ. Because listen, some people in this world, the only Jesus that they'll ever see is you. And so as we live our lives as Christians, God wants us to pursue holiness and become more and more like him so that other people can experience Christ through our lives. And then he's also given us the Holy Spirit to help us with that. We don't have to do it on our own. He's given us the church. He's given us a community of people to help us grow. So the question becomes, how do we do that? We pursue holiness is how we, how we live out God. We fight sin. We love God. We love people. We live on mission. This is what it means to be set apart. Peter has the same teaching when it comes to the church. I want you to listen to it in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. This is Peter's definition of the church. He says, but you, the church, are a chosen people. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You're God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. So he says, I've chosen you. I've, I've called you out of darkness and I've given you a purpose. And that purpose is to, is to declare the praises of God uh, in a dark world. He says, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And not only God, not only Peter and Paul, but Jesus had this view of the church. Listen to John 17, 15 through 18. This is Jesus's prayer. He says, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world. He's talking about his church uh, or his people, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. Sanctify them, Christians, that means to, to be more and more like Jesus, by the truth, because your word is truth. And as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. So God wants us to become more and more like him because he's sending us out as his church into the world to show him, 
to other people around us. So here's the question we all have to ask ourselves is, are we pursuing holiness? Like, are you becoming more and more like Christ? Do people see Jesus, not only in the way you talk, but how you live your life? Like, do people see Christ in you? Are you living in this identity that God has already given you? Are you fighting sin to live for God? And then thirdly, he characterizes the church with unity. Verse two, he says, together, 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 that word is all throughout the scriptures when it comes to the church. Together, unified with all those everywhere who call on the name of the Lord. And I love that word, Acts 2, which is uh, kind of the formation of the church uh, in the New Testament. It says, all the believers were what? together and had everything in common. They met together. They did life together. They loved God together. They loved one another together. They lived on mission uh, together. This is what the gospel does. This is what the Holy Spirit does. This is what the word of God does. This is what the mission of God does is it unifies people. And it's beautiful when you think about this picture of, of unity. Now, unity doesn't mean uniformity. It doesn't mean we all look alike, that we all talk just alike, that we all uh, like the same things. It doesn't mean any of that stuff. It doesn't mean we're going to agree on every little thing, but it does mean that we will agree on the most important things. If you go through our heart and soul process, one of the things that we do at the end is we have beliefs as a church, right? And so we have these beliefs, and what we divide them into are basic doctrines, that if you are a Christian and you believe the Bible, these are things you have to believe to be a Christian. If you don't believe these, you are not a Christian. And then we have other beliefs that are uh, theological distinctives. These are things that uh, you or me may disagree on, but we can still be a family together and disagree on these things. But when it comes to the fact that God is a trinity, the fact that the word of God is uh, inerrant and that it, is, it, it holds the authority of God. We have to agree on these things to be a Christian. And so unity in the church is such a big deal uh, to God. The New Testament talks about it over and over and over again. And Jesus, in that same prayer in John 17, I want you to uh, listen to this because he teaches us why unity is such a big deal in the church. Listen to Jesus. He says, my prayer is not for them alone. He's talking about the disciples that are with him. He says, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Uh, side note, Jesus is assuming that his disciples are gonna go out and make other disciples. So he assumes if we're a Christian, that we're gonna make other disciples. The mission is, is assumed if we are a Christian, we live on mission. Uh, side note, back to the scripture. That all of them may be one. Father, just as you and I, you are, or just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. So why is unity such a big deal? It's through the unity of the church that the world sees the greatness of our God and believes in him. Like that's why unity is such a big deal in the church is that when people see how unified we are, how different we are, but how close we are because of our belief in Jesus like a family, it literally shows them the greatness of our God and they want to be a part of what God is doing. This is why God takes division so serious in the church. It's hard to read any book in the New Testament and not see God addressing division within uh, the church. And listen to me, there are, is a lot of division in the church today. Like We don't read this and think, oh, what a bunch of idiots, they're divided in the church. No, like this is still an issue for us today. There's so many churches, uh, including ours, that have division in them, and God is not okay with that. God wants us to deal with that. Satan loves division in the church. He loves division over music. He loves division over race. He loves division over politics, over money, over certain sins. He loves division caused by unforgiveness and gossip and uh, personal preferences and, and selfishness. This is how Satan gets a foothold in the church is he uses the sin of individual people like me and you to cause division so that the church can't function and work the way it's supposed to and glorify God the way that it's supposed to. And when the world sees this division, it wants no part of it. Why would we wanna be a part of it? You ever seen just a, a group of people that just fight, that literally just show up 
uh, like a like a uh, some of y'all's family maybe. And so you, you come to a family gathering, and there's always just some sort of underneath elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about, and it's like nobody's real. Nobody wants to be a part of that. Well, the church that has division in it, that is exactly what it's like. But I want you to imagine with me for a minute what a unified church looks like. This is our aim. This is what we want. It's a church that's characterized by togetherness, togetherness. It's a church made up of all kinds of people from all walks of life. It's a church uh, that, that truly loves one another like family, that doesn't just show up on Sundays and wave and go about your business, but is truly doing life together, a church unified by the gospel and the authority of God's word. It's not about what one person thinks or another person thinks. What unifies us is what Jesus thinks and what Jesus said. That's what draws us uh, together as Christian, a church united together by the spirit of God and the mission of God, a church that literally functions, as the Bible says, one body with one spiritual head that we may have feet over here, we may have hands over here, we may have legs over here and arms over here, but we're all unified because we think the same things are important because we believe the gospel and Christ is our Lord. That's the picture that Jesus wants us to have of the church. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the power of that in a world full of division? What a tangible picture of God's love and unity would do it would solve so many issues because people don't need another sermon. They need an example to look at. And this is what God's designed the church to be. Are you willing to fight for that with me? Are you willing to be a part of that with me? I need to know that you're with me because this is what God has called us to be. Are you willing to love people? Are you willing to love people that aren't like you? Are you willing to love difficult people that may be a challenge for you to live? Are you willing to forgive people, maybe even people that have hurt you in some sort of way? Are you willing to forgive? This is what it takes to be unified. Are you willing to prioritize diversity? Are you willing to hang out with people that may not run in your circle or have the same amount of money that you do or may not be the same color as you are? This is what God's church is designed to be, a place full of every tribe, every nation, all types of people. And under that, the glory of God begins to just radiate through this community. It's, it's so much of a shame that the most divided hour of our country is 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. Uh, God hates that. And it's time for somebody to say, let's step into this and let's begin to live out what God wants for his church. But it's easy to talk it are you gonna invite people into your home that are not like you? That's where the rubber meets the road. We have to begin to live like God wants us to live. And this won't be easy, but I can promise you it will be worth it. I love the words of Paul in Ephesians 3, verse 10. He says, his intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly realms. The manifold wisdom of God. This is what the unified church just radiates into the community. Just the light of the gospel shines everywhere. We don't even have to say anything. We just show people based on the way that we live life together. We love one another. We provide for one another. We share life with each other. We don't gossip and tear each other down. We don't shoot people because they got issues. No, we walk beside them. We help them. Anywhere there's brokenness in our church, we, don't, we come beside it. Anywhere there's brokenness in our community, we step into it. Like This is what God's designed the church to be about. This is what it is. The second thing that we see in this passage is the work of God's grace in our lives. Verses four through nine, I, I love this. This is Paul's uh, a, a part of the way he normally writes letters is he'll do a greeting and then he'll jump right into just thanking God for this group of people. I think it's awesome. But in this, this, uh, this uh, thankfulness and this gratitude, uh, we, we see uh, that, he's, that he's pointing to the grace of God and the work of God in these people's lives. Listen, he says, I always thank my God for you because of God's grace given to you in Christ Jesus. For in him, Christ, you have been enriched, I told you to underline that word, enriched, with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge, and God thus confirming our testimony about Christ 
among you. So how did, how did, he, how did he confirm that God was at work among the Corinthians? Their life was different. Like they, they, they had been radically trained, changed. Their, their life had been enriched in every way. Verse seven, therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift. I told you to underline spiritual gift. As you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. Verse eight, he will also keep you firm to the end. So the grace of God keeps us. Uh, I told you to underline that. So that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So notice in his thanksgiving that Paul is pointing uh, to the grace of God. That's what comes to mind when he thinks of God starting this church in the most corrupt society uh, in the world at this time. He thinks about the grace of God opening the eyes of blind, lost believers and starting just an incredible movement where people are literally getting saved and baptized and God is doing an incredible work in their midst. He is amazed at the work of grace that God is doing in their life. And truly, grace changes everything. Like it really does. Even today, grace is the, the, the change. And I want you to write this definition of grace down. This comes from our pastor over in our Statesboro location, and, and I've always, I'll never forget it. Grace is God's unconditional love and unmerited favor. You've probably heard that before. Grace is God's unconditional love. It's basically a gift, giving us what we do not deserve, and it's an unmerited favor. It's a favor given to us by God that we do not deserve. But listen, uh, it's, it's, it, and here's what it does. God, grace is God's unconditional love and unmerited favor that moves him, moves God, to do for us and in us and through us what we cannot do for ourselves. So a lot of people, when they think about the grace of God, all they think about is the initial salvation, where it's like, okay, God ripped me out of sin and now put me into uh, the kingdom of God. I don't have to go to hell. I'm going to heaven. God, thank you for your gift of grace. But this is not how Paul views grace. Grace not only saves us, grace continues to work in our life. We see it over and over. Grace is doing some incredible things in the life of these Corinthian believers. And there's three things that Paul points out here. The first thing is this, grace enriches their lives. It enriches our lives. Verse uh, five, I told you to underline this in six. For in him you have been enriched in every way. God's grace enriches our life. This word enrich, it means literally filthy rich. We think about somebody who has a ton of money, but that's not what it's talking about. It's saying God's grace literally makes our life better. Like it literally increases uh, our, our life to a better place. It, it, it changes everything. It changes the way they think. It says uh, it, it enriched their speech and their knowledge. It changes the way they talked. It changes the way they acted. It changed their life forever. This is what grace does. It transforms our lives. It literally opens our eyes for the very first time to truth, to real knowledge, and to what life should be. Because the only way for us to know what we're truly created for is to connect with our creator, which is God. And when we begin to, when God opens our eyes to see him for who he is and to see ourselves for who we are and the purpose in which we were created, then now for the very first time, our lives can be enriched to what they were created to be. What an incredible gift of grace. Listen to how Paul uh, talks about this in uh, Titus chapter two, verses 11 through 14. He says, for the grace of God has appeared. So the grace of God is not a thing, it's a person, Jesus. He appeared that offers salvation to all people and it, this grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and live self-controlled and upright and godly lives in this present age. So he's teaching us that, that this grace teaches us to live differently, to think differently, to care about different things. It literally changes everything. So here's my question. Has God's grace changed everything in your life? Has it enriched your life? Do you see the life in Christ to live life the way Christ designed for you to live? Do you see that as the best life? Because if you don't, you've missed the point. Because God didn't come to force you to live a life that you don't wanna live. You've missed it. This is the story of the rich young ruler when he walks up to, to Jesus and Jesus says, hey, I want you to sell everything you have and go and give it to the poor and then come and follow me. And he says, no, I'm sad, I don't wanna do that. I, I like my money too much. And 
God tells him he has a, he has a misconstrued view of who God is. Because God would never ask us to do something that's not the best thing for us and for his glory. This is our God. He's good. And so when we come to God, he comes to enrich our life. He's calling us into a better life. Has God's grace changed your life? Because listen, life change is what confirms uh, the work of grace in your life. This is what Paul is saying. He's saying, listen, I can confirm the testimony among you because your lives have been changed so much. Are they perfect? No, but they're changing to live for God. Secondly, the grace of God gifts us to be a part of the church. It gifts us for the church. It says, therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. So by God's grace, we're all given spiritual gifts to now be a part of God's purpose, which is to be a part of his church to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. And so this means, literally, that there are no sideline Christians in God's church. So it's not like, oh, there's Billy. He can preach. Man, God's gifted him as a teacher. So, man, let's go to his church and let's just kind of depend on his gift. No, that's not how God designed the church. There's no one-man wolf packs in Christianity. Like, this is God's people together. God's given you a spiritual gift, me a spiritual gift, and he intends on us locking arms and walking side by side. It's why when you walk in our church, if you look at the blue, uh, what we call connectors or the orange connectors on their shirt, there should be a saying. And that saying should say, every person has a purpose. And that's what we believe. Is that what I believe? No, that's what the Bible teaches. That's why I believe it. So we don't just put a cute saying on a church, on a shirt. This is literally the word of God. Listen to how Paul talks about it in Romans 12. He says, For, uh, by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has given and distributed to each of you. He says, for just as each of us has one body, he's talking about the, the human body, with many members. That means we have arms, legs, hands, feet, all this. And these members do not all have the same function. So you can't use a foot as a hand or a hand as a foot, vice versa, so they don't have the same function. So in Christ, we, the church, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We all have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's encouraging, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's leading, then do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, then do it cheerfully. So God's grace not only gets us on the team, but God's grace equips us to be a contributor on the team. Right, So it's not like LeBron James when he played for the Cavaliers, and it was just him. And he had like, I, don't, I can't even name, like Mo Williams maybe with the point guard, but I don't even know who else was on the team. They, they just didn't contribute. LeBron did everything and almost won uh, the championship. I can't say that about Michael Jordan and the Bulls, but uh, he could have probably done the same thing. But you see what I'm saying? Like in the church, there's no like, oh, there's just Billy and there's nobody else that contributes. Or there's just Paul and nobody else contributes. No, God's grace gets us onto the team it saves us, but it also equips us to be a contributor on the team. So the question we have to ask is, are we a contributor? Like, are you a contributor in God's church? One, are you on the team? But two, are you a contributor? Like, God's, if you're a Christian, God has given you gifts. This is another thing we talk about in heart and soul over and over again. It's like, what gifts has God given you? Like, like what are you passionate about? Like, who has God literally put on your heart to go and reach? Or what has he put on your heart to, to go and do? What has he given you gifts and talents and abilities to go and do? Because the church needs you to do that. Obviously, God has sent you here for a purpose, and we want you uh, to do what God has asked you to do. And we as a church want to come alongside of you and help equip you and support you. So what is it? Like, you got to begin to think the way a contributor Things. And then thirdly, uh, the grace of God keeps us to the end. This may be my favorite promise in all of Scripture. Verse 8. He will also, grace, God, will also keep you firm to the end 
so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So not only does grace call us, not only does grace save us, not only does grace grow us, not only does grace seal us, but grace keeps us. Do you understand what Paul is saying? He's basically saying that your life as a Christian is, is in the hands of God. Like God is for you, like not against you. Like God is with you. Like God doesn't give up on people. Like he doesn't, he, he doesn't trade people in like a used car when they don't work or, they, or when, they, when they mess up. Like God is committed to you. He's committed to your growth and your sanctification and so that you can become more and more like Jesus. You realize the weight and the pressure that takes off of you. So now it's less about you and more about aligning to God and, and the spirit of God to, to allow him to do the work in you that he wants to do. And if you're anything like me and you fail every day and you're trying to fight at this thing to be more and more like Christ every day, that promise will bring you great, great joy. And great, great hope reminds me of Philippians 1, 6, where Paul says, I'm confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. And then he goes on to say in Philippians 2, he says, so now you continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So it's not an excuse to sit back and say, oh, well, God's going to do the work in me. I don't have to do anything. No, it's now that God's with you and for you, let's, let's, let's become more and more like Jesus. Let's take steps so that we can do this. That's why you'll hear me often tell you, God is in you. He's with you. He's for you. So you keep taking next steps when he puts it in front of you because next steps is what leads you to become more and more like Christ. The good thing about our God is he don't ask you to take a thousand steps at one time. Aren't you thankful for that? He just asked you to take the next one. What is it? Is it to join a small group today? Is it to be saved and surrender your life to Christ? Is it to take a next step of baptism? Is it to begin to be a part of the church and go to heart and soul? Is it to share your faith with somebody at work that you know needs the gospel? What is it? You don't have to do a thousand things. Just do whatever it is that God is placing on your heart to do. The third thing is this, a firm correction. Again, in verses 10 through 17, we see Paul address the issue that's going on. He says that there are quarrels among you. And then we say, well, whoa, that's crazy. People actually fight in the church in the Bible. So that's not just something that we do. No, every church has issues. Every church, every church. There's no perfect church, including ours. The only church that doesn't have fighting and issues going on is the church that does not have people in it. And we need to understand this. We need to understand this, that no church in the world is perfect. Every one of them has issues, including this one. So I wanna give you some bad news and I'm gonna give you some good news. The bad news is this. Connection Church by day is not a perfect church. If you think it is, you haven't been here long enough. At some point, somebody in this church is gonna say something or they're gonna do something or I'm gonna say something that's going to offend you. And by all means, I'm not trying to offend you. But it's gonna happen. We're gonna have issues. We have issues right now. But the good news is this, our church is not defined by our issues. Our church is defined and will be defined by how we respond to the issues. Because here's the truth of the matter. Church issues are caused by church people. That could be me. That could be you. That could be somebody sitting around you right now. And so because of this, we have to begin to ask ourselves some questions. And I want us to learn from the people in Corinthians here. This is exactly what's happening. What's the issue? There's division over teachers. Some want Apollo. Some want Peter. Some want Paul. Some just want Jesus. Well, what's the correction? Paul tells them, focus on Jesus. Quit being focusing on preachers. It doesn't matter who's up there. It just matters that the word of God's being presented. So it's not about, uh, it's not about a person. It's about Christ. Well, how do they respond? 
The passage doesn't tell us how they respond, but luckily the book of 2 Corinthians teaches us how they respond. 2 Corinthians 7, 8 through 10, listen to this. Even if I, this is Paul talking to them again, even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, he's talking about the first letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, and I see that my letter hurt you. So he saw that it, it hurt him. Like when he wrote and corrected, and he's gonna keep correcting a lot of things, but it hurt him. But it only hurt him for a little while. He says, yet now I'm happy. Not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. He says, for you became sorrowful as God intended. And so were not harmed in any way by us. And godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and life and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. So we see that correction wasn't fun for the Corinthians. Like to be told that you're wrong or to be told that you're doing something wrong is not fun. But as a Christian, we live a life of correction. Like we're constantly trying to figure this thing out. Like there's no point in your walk with God that you ever arrive. So nobody walks in the kingdom of God with an arrogant swag because we're all in process and we're all continuing to grow. But listen, the process of correction that God wants to do in our life is a good thing. Like God never corrects us uh, out of a bad heart. Like he literally only corrects us with two things in mind, love for us and his plan to use us for his glory. And those things are the best things for us. And so we need to understand this when God brings correction into our life. Like it is the difference between life and death. Like it's exactly what he tells the Corinthians. Praise God you repented and turned from your ways and turned back to God because it's brought life and salvation to the church, to your life. And if you would have not done that, he says worldly sorrow, even if you would have felt sorry about it but nothing changed, that would have led you to death and the church would have died and you would have died spiritually in your relationship with God. And so this is what God wants in our lives. So my question for you and I and every person in this room is, how will you respond to the correction of God in your life? If, if Jesus Christ showed up right here today, what correction would he have for our church? Better yet, if Jesus Christ showed up today, what correction would he have for you? Like, what would he talk to you about? Of course, he would say, the first thing is I love you and I got a plan for your life. But then he would say, hey, I've seen this in your life and it's taken you to death, but I want life for you. I wanna enrich your life and this is what I have for you. Would you turn from that today and turn to me? What is that? I don't know what that is in every person's life. I know what that is in my life and I pray every day that God would show me more and more things that I need to turn away from because I wanna know God. I wanna live for God. I wanna experience life as God designed it to be. Is that what you want? Right where you are, I want you to bow your head. Listen, I don't know what God's doing in your heart. I don't know what the Spirit of God's doing in your life right now. But here's what I know. How you respond to what God's trying to teach you right now is the difference between life and death. Spiritual life and spiritual death. For some of us, that next step may be salvation. And we know it, we don't have a relationship with God. We've never turned from our sin to God and asked God to change our life forever. We've never trusted in his finished work on the cross. If you're in here today, you'd say, Billy, that's me. Today is the day of salvation. Would you lift your hand right where you're at? I wanna pray for you. We'd love to pray for you and get you any resources you need. Anybody in here, I'm gonna ask you to be bold. You'd say, Billy, that's me, 100%. I'll give you a second, raise it high. I can see it. So God, my prayer for the rest of us is this, God, that you would show us areas of our life, God, that need to change. God, thank you for loving us enough to correct us. God, thank you for loving us enough to not give up on us. God, we wanna live for you. God, we wanna know you. God, we wanna, we wanna show your glory to this world. 
And God, it starts with us being open-handed to what you're trying to do in our life. So today, Lord, I pray as we sing this last song, God, would you do a work in our heart? If we need to come deal with you at the altar, then praise God, let's do it. We need to sit in our seat and deal with you. Whatever it is, I pray today that people would not leave until they've done business with you. Father, we love you, we're thankful for you, and we praise you in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Would you stand to your feet?